Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's reading group. Uh, we're having the authors of the Graph GPS paper presenting their newest graph transformer. Hello, this is Vijay. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and my research interests are in graph representation learning with specific focus on how we can uh, improve the existing GNNs uh, by exploring positional encodings and graph transform architectures. Thank you. Hello, and I'm Ladislav Rampasek. I'm a postdoc at Mila and uh, University of Montreal. Hi, Michael here, also a postdoc at Mila, working on different aspects of graph representation learning. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, happy to be here. Thank you for, for having us. Uh, so I'm Ladislav, and uh, I'll, I'm happy to present the paper with uh, Michael over here. Uh, VJ is also in the call, and so is Dominic. Uh, it's been a great uh, collaboration that we have going, and uh, today uh, we'll present actually uh, two papers uh, briefly. Uh, so the main one, as you saw, is the, the graph GPS, the recipe for building the general powerful and scalable graph transformer. Uh, and then also VJ will talk about uh, five new uh, benchmarks for uh, uh, testing long-range dependencies in graphs. So it's uh, five new data sets uh, that really uh, put a lot more stress on the model to be able to, uh, to perform well. It really needs to capture some, some longer-range distances uh, or dependencies. So that's roughly the, uh, the goal for today when it comes to the papers. And uh, yeah, um, let's, let's hop into it. Uh, we'll start a little bit with the message passing versus graph transformers and so on. But uh, that's a very common introduction. So I'll uh, really uh, breeze through it so that uh, I'm not repeating what the, all the other speakers uh, also uh, say. And we'll dive into the, the graph GPS. All right. So just to, to motivate why graph transformers, um, as, as uh, with, with a lot of the recent papers, the motivation is that the first order message passing neural networks are limited by the uh, one WL expressivity. Um, and uh, also because they are performing pretty much just uh, low pass uh, filtering and uh, that leads to over smoothing of the features of the uh, of the nodes uh, that we are learning that tend to then um, converge to global or local uh, averages and uh, the high frequency information is lost. Further, as, as the uh, message passing progresses, the size of the neighborhood that is being uh, processed grows exponentially. And uh, when you have a limited representational capacity with some fixed size representation, that leads to that over squashing of the information. And all these uh, aspects lead to uh, poor ability of this first order message passing GNNs to represent long range dependencies in the graphs. Uh, so for that, a lot of work has been already uh, proposed how to alleviate these issues, uh, either be it higher order GNNs, adding some, uh, some aspects of the graph topology, rewiring the graphs or other kinds of like surgery to, to shorten the distances so that the, the information uh, can, can pass uh, uh, faster. That would also maybe another direction are hierarchical models. And today we will we'll, we'll, uh, talk about the graph transformer approach that adds the global attention so that uh, technically the, uh, all nodes are connected with, with just a single hop. Uh, so let's let's uh, look at it first. What are the kind of principal benefits and and uh, problems with with adding transformers on on graphs? So uh, the naive approach of just uh, tokenizing the nodes uh, and passing it through a transformer uh, has several several pros and cons. The the pros is that it decouples the computational uh, graph structure from the from the graph structure of the of the input graph, and hence we can do potentially more efficient uh, message passing or or in, or uh, computation on that graph, and we really don't have an issue then with uh, 
with uh, capturing long range uh, dependencies. However, uh, with that, we lose the, the structure of the graph and uh, we also lose uh, this kind of nice uh, inductive bias that the message passing neural networks have where the, uh, which is the locality uh, bias, I would call it, uh, that uh, the graph structure typically is informative, right? Like if uh, um, that the similar node, that the nodes that are close together somehow interact or are uh, similar or, or there is some kind of uh, dependency between them. And it's, and it's typically, uh, there's, there's good reason to think that uh, uh, there is some kind of bias for the locality that uh, the closer you are, the higher chances that that, that node is actually uh, important for you or from the perspective of a node. And uh, uh, that is kind of out of the window if we, if we don't consider anything else with the graph transformer. Um, so that's maybe something that we would want to keep. And then the, the next problem is the quadratic complexity of a standard transformer, which now uh, is quadratic from the number of nodes, while message passing neural networks are linear in the number of edges. And uh, most of the, the graphs are sparse, where the number of edges is, is roughly proportional to the number of nodes, and, and, and it's not actually quadratic. So uh, the scale, of the, the, uh, in other words, is the issue here. So uh, and let me get, go back to the first problem, and that is the identifiability of the nodes in the graph, uh, and the fact that uh, if you don't do anything, we, we really lose the, the, the structure of the graph uh, as a whole. Uh, so this is also a case uh, studied in, in NLP and other applications that the transformers were originally developed for and applied to. Uh, and there, the positional encodings are using these uh, sines and cosines functions. And they turn out to be really just the uh, like pretty much equivalent to uh, eigen decomposition of the Laplacian of a of a path graph. So if you were to consider the um, the input uh, sentence as as a as a graph uh, where just uh, each each word is connected to the next one, that's that would be a path graph. And uh, the spectrum of, of Laplacian of a path graph turns out to be sines and cosines functions. And that's actually also what uh, the standard uh, positional encoding in NLP and also in, in uh, vision transformers are using. So natural kind of way how to, uh, how to put the graph structure back into a transformer is then looking at the uh, Laplacian of the graph. Um, it's really naturally just an extension from the, from the path graph if, if you want to look at it from this perspective. Uh, but we can also use other than, than that kind of position, uh, that kind of encodings. And uh, in this work, we uh, try to kind of categorize the different approaches. One can return back the, the position and structure of the uh, position of the nodes and the structure of the graph into, uh, into the input so that the, the transformer uh, doesn't perceive the, uh, the graph as just uh, a set of nodes. And uh, one would be these positional encodings where uh, the uh, main principle is, is trying to somehow capture the position in the graph, uh, the best, um, and then the structural encodings, as I mentioned, are those where we're looking at uh, capturing the uh, subgraph structure, uh, whether it's like rings, um, stars, or something like that. Uh, so it's, it doesn't give you um, location information, but it gives you information about like how the neighborhood of a node looks like. Um, next, we also uh, realized that there, there's uh, different kinds between these positional and structural encodings. And roughly speaking, uh, you could also uh, subcategorize them to local, global, and relative. So, uh, so this is just an illustration from uh, our blog post that is on uh, Michael's uh, Medium post, so, so go check that one out as well. Um, so 
Uh, here, what, what we're trying to visualize is that uh, the global positional encoding, let's say, is trying to give you this, this coordinate system as if like some pseudo coordinate system. For that, the most natural uh, thing are, let's say, these uh, eigenmaps. So uh, the embedding derived from, from the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian, because it's, it's really uh, is giving you an uh, uh, Euclidean em embedding of, of the graph. Uh, then uh, uh, then you can have local positional encoding that are just looking at uh, how how far uh, things are uh, within some some subcluster or or cluster of the node uh, of the graph. It doesn't quite give you the information globally. And then the relative positional encodings are more like distance based encodings. These have been explored also previously, like uh, Anli's paper on distance uh, encoding uh, and such. Uh, I think that paper dates like two, three years uh, back. So that would be that type of uh, encodings that, that kind of give you the distance between the nodes, but don't really give you the, uh, the position. All right, uh, so let's hop into the, the positional encodings then. Uh, so here, uh, we roughly tried to categorize them uh, under these three sections, as I mentioned, and the positional encoding is giving you the information about where you are in the graph. So for uh, local positional encodings, it would be, uh, let's say, the distance to the cluster, as I mentioned, or you can look at uh, the non-diagonal values of uh, random walks. Then for the global positional encoding, uh, you can look at uh, the um, eigen, uh, eigen map, so that would be uh, the eigenvectors that are derived from the Laplacian, but also you can use other uh, matrices uh, and so on. And then for the relatives, I already uh, kind of <laughs> talked about it, are these distances based on, again, diffusion, uh, let's say heat kernels, random walks, uh, and also uh, gradients of eigenvectors, such as uh, in Dominic's pa uh, paper uh, in the directional graph neural networks. Uh, it, that's what, the, what the, they've done there. So that's a really cool uh, relative embedding as well. Um, and in this paper, we, we really focus on just one kind, uh, and that is the, uh, the eigen map uh, position line codings, so derived from the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian. So let's just quickly talk about that one. Um, so uh, here it's just a visualization from last year's paper by uh, Devin and Dominic on uh, uh, rethinking graph transformer spectral attention. So that's the SAND paper that was also present in this reading group around like a year ago. Um, so good memories. And uh, here they had a really nice visualization of uh, uh, how the uh, eigen uh, eigenvectors visualized over a molecule look like and how with the growing eigenvalue of the respective eigenvector you're getting higher frequency information and that the probably the most important ones are those with the low frequency because they are giving you uh, uh, more smooth signal over the graph and giving you better kind of um, or uh, res uh, like better kind of information about where you are in the graph, like the higher frequency tends to be more noisy uh, and not as much useful. And um, yeah, so uh, that's also the paper where they uh, introduce this etiquette for like how to deal with these eigenvectors and eigenvalues, because it's not so uh, straightforward how to actually derive the positional encodings from, from this, like on, on the surface, it's like a simple idea that you just Kind of generate the eigenmap and, and plug it in but uh, the issue is that it is not unique and uh, even when we consider the, the top k eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, the, the issue is that um, these eigenvectors are sign invariant uh, because if, uh, if an eigenvector is um, uh, if you have one vector that is uh, that's that is an eigenvector, then also the negative of it is right, and then uh, multiplicities. So in a lot of these these graphs, in the reality, it turns out that uh, this, the that you will have multiple eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue. Then you can have any kind of linear combination of them and still 
uh, the eigenvector, and uh, the, the solvers are not going to return you a unique, unique value, uh, unique vectors, or in uh, kind of unique order. So each time you kind of run that, you're running into this issue. Um, so you need to deal with that too. And uh, also, uh, depending on how many top k eigenvectors you want to, to use for that position line codings, uh, maybe your data set is going to have graphs that have uh, fewer nodes than that, that k that you selected. And then you need to somehow pad it or somehow deal with it that you, you don't quite have uh, that, that many eigenvectors uh, as, as you want. So you need to be able to, to, to handle variable number of the eigenvectors. So uh, the, the first original graph transformer, but BJ, uh, dealt with it with, by uh, uh, this kind of uh, set of tricks. Uh, the first one for the sign invariance, they just use the um, random flipping uh, of, the, of the sign during the training as a form of standard uh, input and augmentation to, to try to make the model invariant to the sign. Uh, as far as I know, they didn't deal with uh, the uh, eigenvector eigenvalue multiplicities, and uh, they selected then uh, the, the k such that every uh, such that it's less uh, or equal to to the minimum size of a of a graph in the data set. So, so it kind of really, really restricts uh, the, the selection of the k uh, because if you have just a couple uh small small graphs you uh you're you're quite limited so that's where a dominic's paper came in last year and um they uh applied uh, a graph transformer uh sorry another transformer on, on top of these uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues uh so they retain for when it comes to design invariance they they retain uh the approach of of uh, augmenting the input by sign flipping and uh, for these multiplicities and variable number, they think they uh, consider the concatenation of the eigenvalue and, all, and the eigenvector and consider that as a sequence uh, or as uh, some kind of set that was then processed by the transformer, uh, which naturally then handles the variable, variable number. Uh, we found uh, in, in these further experiments that really the, the transformer is not quite necessary and you ju can just replace it with deep sets. So our variation that we ended up using uh, simplifies things. It's still doing the, the random sign flipping, but we replace the transformer by just deep sets and, and treat that as, as a set of, uh, as a set of, um, uh, pairs where you have the eigenvalue and uh, eigenvector. And uh, then uh, we also experimented with Synet uh, from uh, Derek Lim that was also presented here a couple months ago and uh, last week at, uh, at ICML, uh, where they uh, really solved uh, the issue with the sign invariance uh, in a principled way. Uh, they show that if you process the eigenvectors uh, uh, in, in this fashion, where you have the uh, where you apply some uh, some function uh, on uh, the eigen eigenvalue and uh, sorry eigenvector and then on the, the negative of the eigenvector and, and sum them together and process each eigenvector uh, uh, node value this way and then push it through uh, through some aggregation function which in their case would be MLP or or deep sets uh, then. Uh, you don't have to do the uh, random flipping. This, this is guaranteed to be sign invariant, uh, which is uh, which is great. In the practice, uh, what uh, what they end up doing is that this this phi function here is a eight layer uh, gene a model graph isomorphism network, and uh, um, then as I mentioned, this raw is then either an MLP or deep set, and uh, that's what we ended up using as well. Um, and uh, what I want to say here is that, that, that this turns this Laplacian positional encoding into a little bit more than Laplacian positional encoding, because if you are applying the, the gene, um, then uh, you, you don't quite know it's a learnable function now. So, the, so it's a learn, learnable positional encoding, really. And it can be looking at the, the distances or differences between, between the neighboring 
uh, nodes, so it can kind of turn it into a relative positional encoding and not quite in, into a global positional encoding. And also, since it's uh, using the the structure of the graph for the for the gene, uh, it can also capture some some aspects of the local structure of the graphs. So this is really quite turning into a, a bit of a hybrid uh, encoding that uh, has the the potential to capture some kind of structure already into the positional encodings uh, on top of the the kind of eigenmap that that we are trying to deal with. So that's roughly the the ways how you can deal with uh, the uh, the La, uh, Laplacian of the of the graph and how to derive positional encodings. Um, and uh, the next version that we also experimented with is uh, work by uh, Van Gadal from Panelist Group, and that's this um, peg layer uh, that is using the relative uh, positional encoding, what, or what we would call the, the relative type positional encoding, where they uh, pretty much scale uh, the message aggregation in a GNN layer by uh, the distance of the nodes in the eigenspace and then project it through an MLP. So uh, here you, you can see this is the kind of standard uh, formulation for a GNN, uh, GCN layer. Here you have the, uh, uh, but here you have that conditioning of the agency matrix based on uh, the distance uh, of the nodes uh, where this ZU, ZV is the this, uh, are the eigenvectors and uh, uh, phi here is, is an, a learnable MLP. So we tried that as well uh, and uh, extended this kind of um, conditioning to uh, gated GCN layer and to uh, uh, and to GIN layer. All right. Uh, any questions? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to quickly jump to the structural encodings. None from my side, but please raise your hands if you want to ask something. Otherwise, let's get to into structural encodings. All right, so let's get to the structural ones. So here, the point is to uh, provide the information uh, uh, that would somehow encode what uh, what kind of uh, uh, like how the neighborhood of a node looks like. Is it part of a ring? Is it part of what kind of substructure or something along the lines? Or how does the graph look like uh, at locally or globally? So from the local perspective, you can look at uh, the node degree that would be very very basic uh, way of uh, capturing the structure. Uh, we really like the random walk diagonals so that um, because that can give you really nice information about some of the substructures. Uh, it's even typically used for like um, computing the um, um, uh, cycles in the graph when you uh, when you start exponentiating the agency matrix. Uh, and uh, once you have uh, so you can look at the values on the diagonal and infer whether the nodes are on a uh, on a, a loop or not, like they are part of a ring or, or not. Um, so that works particularly well in uh, for for odd cycle loops because you you're, you won't be able to return to the starting node on odd number of, of hops uh, unless that node is part of a odd length uh, cycle. Uh, Assuming that you don't have self loops, obviously. Uh, then uh, the other kind of local structural encoding could be looking at the curvature of the graph uh, and so on. Or you can uh, pre compute substructures like uh, triangles, rings, stars, and so on. That there's been a great line of work on, on this type of uh, GNNs before. Uh, we could potentially turn these into, into local structural encodings and augment the. Uh, input to a graph transformer as well with, with any of these informations. Uh, and from global perspective, the eigenvalues are providing you really the global kind of structure of the graph. Uh, then uh, you can look at global properties like the diameter, girth, degree, number of connected components, and such. 
but these might not be so generalizable and depend what what kind of task you have maybe maybe i would uh, like not necessarily use these um then uh, from relative perspective you can then look at similarly to uh dgn um or on at the gradient of any of these local structural encodings um uh, and so on and in our experiments we focused on uh the the uh, relative uh, on the relatively recent but very successful uh, random walk diagonals uh, that BJ has been using uh, in his um, learnable structural and positional uh, representation paper uh, from iClear this year. Uh, so uh, what what it ends up being is that simply uh, you exponentiate the uh, agency matrix to powers from one to some k, so one two three to some let's say twenty, and you get uh, you all that with uh, with your um, and uh, and you, you look at the diagonals, you look at the probabilities of returning back to the starting node. As we mentioned before, in the positional encodings, you could look at also the off diagonal uh, values, and that gives you some some uh, information as well. Uh, but uh, we, we didn't end up using that in this project. We just look at the diagonals. Um, and one of the important kind of tricks was to uh to normalize uh these values as you as you uh as you put them into uh or append them to the to the node features uh because as you start exponentiating like the probability of of uh of, of coming back starts decreasing obviously uh so you're so you numerically start having some kind of uh issues with that so so normalizing that is like a uh kind of important practical trick uh that that ended up working well so, so from this category, this is the, the kind of structural encoding that, that we focused on. All right, so that was kind of the introduction uh, slash uh, first part of our uh, GPS framework. And uh, I hope that in the following uh, rest of the talk, I'll convince you that it's fairly general, powerful, and also scalable. So let's look at the model uh, now itself. Uh, and the model is composed principally of, of uh, two or three components, the way depends how we want to look at it. So first part are these positional and structural encodings that are vital to uh, uh, improve the expressivity of the model and really build in the position and the, the structure of the graph, which otherwise the, the transformer would not be able to capture. And the second part is our GPS layer where we combine uh, a message passing neural network uh, for the local uh, embeddings of the local structure of the graph and also for embedding of the real edges and, and their attributes uh, into node features. And then we use uh, global attention in form of various types of transformers uh, to provide uh, fully connect the fully connectivity and the global attention mechanism to, to be able to exchange the uh, information across the graph uh, in uh, with, with technically just uh, one hop. Um, so this is pretty much the overview. This is the the main I, main. These are the three main components uh, to uh, to the recipe, uh, and you can mix and match uh, these three parts depending on your application, what kind of structure or position you you expect to be important in your data. Uh, how you want to process the local info information and how you want to encode then the the real edges into into node features and then what type of global attention you want to apply on top of it to kind of supercharge the uh, the processing of the of, of the graph. So very simple idea and uh, and if you uh, if you combine uh, these three things uh, in our experiments, in, it turned out working really well for for a lot of uh, data sets. So nothing really fancy, nothing really complicated. Uh, so let's look at the uh, individual components here. So as I mentioned, we are using this uh, local MPNN uh, as a way of, of, in the, uh, of returning back the, that local, locality bias uh, that is important for most of the existing data sets. Um, and uh, 
it, it's something that is otherwise difficult or, or expensive to achieve with uh, global attention. You really have to start messing with the attention mechanism uh, to, to bias it to be local. And for that, you typically have to uh, start uh, conditioning the attention matrix and you have to materialize the uh, n-squared attention matrix uh, and do something uh, along those lines. Um, and uh, that's something that we wanted to avoid. So that's why we, we're uh, using just the MPNN uh, to do that. The other uh, point to, to using the MPNN uh, as part of one layer is that uh, it, it can encode then the real edge features and we don't need to consider edge features in the, in the global attention. Um, so under an assumption that you're using, let's say, uh, the graph isomorphism type network, uh, then uh, with sufficiently large node embedding, um, then it can encode uh, the, the attributes of the, of, the, of the neighborhood of the, in this case, just we consider, let's say, let, that one hot neighborhood and of those real edges into the node, uh, node embedding. And then when you apply the global attention, you don't need to consider uh, the, the real uh, edge features and you don't need to condition the attention uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the transformer explicitly. You can just let, let it be implicit based on the, the node features. Uh, so because that, in, that local information has been already encoded or, or has a way to be encoded into the, the node uh, embeddings beforehand. So uh, then uh, we are using the transform in a very light way. It's really just a kind of a additional kind of uh, connectivity on, on top of the graph. Um, and since it's using, uh, since it's not using these uh, edge properties explicitly, you don't need to materialize the edge intensity matrix. And then you can use some of these off the shelf linear transformers, such as uh, transformer that uh, achieve linear um, computational time from the from the length of the sequence or the, the number of nodes uh, by by kernelizing the attention matrix and not having to materialize it completely. So that's one layer, and then. Uh, where we we're, we're combining this this local view and this global view, uh, we combine it by uh, simply aggregating the uh, the representation from from these two views, and uh, some aggregation is perfectly fine. There has been uh, several works about uh, some aggregation uh, being just as good as, as pretty much anything else that you can can come up with, and in practice it it worked well for us as well. And uh, we are sticking to the kind of uh, transformer type architecture. So we're, uh, we're using uh, dropout with batch norm and uh, skip connections uh, uh, around the, the MPNN model, around the transformer model. And then uh, also when we push it through a two layer MLP to come uh, on top of this, this sound representation. So it's a very transformer-esque architecture. Um, any questions here? None? OK. So uh, and that, this is one layer. And then, then we stack several of these layers. And uh, um, that's, uh, that's the model. Then you can put any any head on on top of it, and in uh, our implementation on GitHub, the Graph GPS, uh, we really uh, try to implement as many data sets as we could that are that are relevant for benchmarking. So we have our data sets for link prediction, uh, node prediction, graph prediction, and so on. Uh, so it works in in a lot of these uh, kind of uh, uh, scenarios. Um, all right. So, what do you? What would you say is maybe, or would you say there are any disadvantages of using the message passing layers in between? So, uh, 
I think when when we are using just a single layer, we are not really getting into an issues of like the over smoothing and over squashing. Uh, no, you don't. Unless you don't have that issue, right? If you like, you you still have the global attention on the on the side. Yeah, technically, the global attention can always over smooth the the signal, for sure. Uh, but uh, you can. Um, in practice, like we limited with uh, also a dropout, so we do have attention dropout, um, and depends on the data set. The, why do you say that the attention layer can over smooth the signal? I mean, technically, if if uh, if uh, like hopefully, like you the, the train model won't do it, but uh, if you have the ability to uh, process. Um, the rest of the graph as a as direct neighborhood, you know, you can just take an average of all the nodes in the graph within one layer, right? So technically speaking, like if you if your goal was to to smooth the, the signal over the graph, then transformer can do that in, in uh, fewer layers than on the yeah, network. We don't especially have any... yeah. Yeah, I want to say like uh, especially when the type of positional and structural encoding that's provided is not good enough then the transformer cannot discern uh, which node to, to connect to based on their position, then this can cause this problem of over smoothing to be much, much larger. Um, because as Vladislav said, it can just smooth everything out if, uh, yeah, if it decides like to, well, if it doesn't use the right features to weight its attention. And the Dom, did you have another comment? Yeah, um, my comment is about like the the addition here. Instead of doing a concatenation, uh, we see in many papers that when they use like uh, different layers in parallel, or they they tend to uh, do a concatenation instead of a sum. So, Ladislav uh, could. Do you explain a bit what would be the advantages here of using the sum instead? And have you experimented with the, the concatenation? Yeah, so I think that first we, we thought of doing the concatenation, uh, but uh, it explodes the obviously the uh, representation and you can easily then do also the, the skip connection uh, to the output. And uh, in practice, the, the summation worked worked better. I, I would say also it's uh, more par parameter efficient, and uh, there is a line of work as far as I, I know that uh, you're not really losing any expressivity by by summing uh, the two representation. Uh, concatenation is not any more more powerful. So. I, uh, on top of that, since we are using here a batch norm before we, we uh, sum them together, uh, we're using a batch norm with actually learnable uh, affine component. So it can also learn gating uh, in a way. Okay. So you can, so the model then can gate as well the contribution from the uh, local and global perspective. But you could still do, uh, like you could still do the skip connection, right? And you could still concatenate instead and just feed it to your two layer MLP. And your two layer MLP then just produces a smaller representation again. Uh, yeah, but then, then, I, uh, then it depends like what would you, you skip connector, right? like if in here instead I, of the same, I, I would do the exact same skip connection. Um, the thing is that right, like from from this transformer, let's say it comes as a dimension D from from the yeah, and okay. also comes D. Um, then this this would be two D, so your output yeah. would be two D, and then uh, the, then I mean like you could kind of skip connect on on each dimension separately. Uh, but you will still end up with 2D that you need to push into D. So no, that no, no, no. Like, I mean, right? you can just concatenate. Oh, how do I draw? Uh, you can just concat 
okay, so now I draw. You can just concatenate your thing here, your vector here, your vector here, and then put it into your MLP. And then you, yeah, you do the same thing. You take this and add it here, and you take this and add it here, and you have the exact same script connection. Yeah, so you can you can do that, but you're you're really not winning anything because, uh, as far as I know, like there is like you can try it and maybe like in practice the optimization or or parameterization end up working better, but you're really not winning anything then by uh, uh, by doing that concatenation. Yeah. But all the, you're stuck well, with uh, different, different games. Yeah, you, you have to so. consider. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, the, wouldn't what you, what you're saying, Hannes? Wouldn't it cause uh, exponential growth in the number of parameters? That's like uh, you need to grow by factor of two every layer. No, um, I think uh, he's proposing hey, to uh, concatenate in the you... channel. Is it correct? What? Okay, no. So um, we just concatenate, concatenate our two vectors here. And then the output of this will be dimension D and not 2D, right? Our two layer MLP goes from 2D to D. And we add our D vector to this D dimensional output here. And we add this D vector to the D dimensional output here. So we would not end up with an exploding, exploding number of dimensions. But all I want to get uh, to with here, uh, that's not so English, the sentence, but uh, all I want to say is, right, this isn't like, that. I, I don't think there's a, a motivation or, or maybe you disagree, but maybe there's not a strict motivation or a good explanation why this makes sense. Uh, to now here use the sum instead of concatenating and there's no reason why concatenating would not be possible as well without um, while still having the skip connections the same way and everything uh, the only difference uh, the, the thing why we go with the sum here is because we tried it and it worked better and that's the only yeah it's well, just some deep learning yeah, thing I, I can't I do issues with it like i didn't like that idea so that's why i didn't like um i mean look i, I realistically like of course you can do this and try it out and, and tune it also this whole architecture is 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 very basic and and definitely like i'm not saying that this is the only way to combine the the two representations uh, but what i wanted to say is that if you were to do take the concatenation and then do skip connection this way. You're losing the gating in a way because, um, or well, you could still like add these two together. Um, I don't know. I I didn't quite like that idea of doing that, but you can definitely do it. Uh, I think just another variation. Uh, it takes more parameters because then your first player here. At, at very least, this first layer uh, yes, has to yes. uh, has to go from 2D to D or something like that, or have some kind of pyramidal uh, connections, and that all is taking extra parameters that are not really helping the model, and especially when you're you're doing um, uh, it's it, I found it to be not not efficient, uh, but you can do it. Like I'm not saying that you can't. <laughs> um, also. Um... Yeah, I'd like to say also that like the idea that Hannes proposed actually uses the sum aggregation, but for the residual connection. Like you can, yes, you concatenate before the MLP, but you're still doing a sum aggregation for the residual connection because uh, you sum them all at, at the end. So in the end, it becomes like either you do the sum and then pass into an MLP or like you still do the sum yeah. and you do the concatenation also so uh, in some sense it, it also makes it uh, more, more complicated um and uh, one, one thing that that Vladislav mentioned is that uh yeah we, with the batch norm here uh and uh, and here before the sum it allows to do a sort of 
uh, a sort of gating so that the network can decide which side is more important the, uh, depending on which layer it is. Um, we, we haven't tested that in the paper, but like one of the ideas that we have is that maybe at the first few layers, this part is stronger because um, like locality is a good inductive bias when you have a shallow network. And after words like uh, this part, the attention becomes more prevalent uh, be because like um, at the later layer, it becomes more important to reason about the entire graph structure instead of just uh, locality. Uh, we, we haven't tested that, but that, that's a hypothesis that, that I have, uh, or at least one advantage that I see with having the, the sum instead of the concatenation. Um, yeah, so thanks for, for answering the question, Ladislav. Uh, there's um, also yeah. uh, there's also someone else who raised his hand, uh, called Deep, if you have... Uh, yeah. I uh, hi, uh, uh, thanks for presentation and uh, uh, basically answering these quite uh, uh, pinpointed questions, which are, are relevant. So I have one question on the scalability aspect. So I was reading the paper and also uh, listening to you. One of a uh, 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 claim of the work is scalability. So as far as I understood about scalability, one of the element is coming from using the linear transformer. So for example, even in Vijay, uh, Vijay's paper or Dominic's uh, paper in SAN, if you replace the uh, uh, the, the full full attention with any linear transformer, those models also become scalable, kind of, right? I mean, end of the day, you use an external PE, do not change the self-attention as it is, but you can use them. So in, in your work, how does this scalability is coming from besides replacing the core transformer? And uh, like, have you really tested it? Yeah, so... Uh, I think that's a great question, and uh, I'll uh, defer it by like a few seconds uh, because that's the next few slides that I have here where uh, I get into a uh, little bit of what the attention looks like, and we, here we can compare what the other attention models have to do, and uh, that they can directly use the, the performer or some of these linear transformer ideas uh, as easily. Okay. So, so I will get to that. Um, sure. so, so maybe uh, hold just, on uh, and then, uh, then uh, we will discuss it further. Before then, just with this, to finish off the construction of the, of the layer kind of debate, uh, I would say that we also try different kind of normalizations. Some, sometimes people ask, like, how about the layer norm, graph norm, and uh, other norms that, uh, that are out there that show that they work better. Uh, I tried on on uh, on uh, one of the data sets and haven't seen that much of a, a benefit. Uh, the batch norm actually worked better, and it's for some reason in line of uh, observations also from from VJ and uh, uh, and San that uh, somehow the batch norm and uh, works better with the. Uh, with the uh, these graph transformer uh, approaches, uh, I think that's that's something that that needs more investigation of like how all that kind of works out. Uh, so uh, just a note on on that. Uh, and uh, was there anything else here that uh, I wanted to mention? Oh yeah, maybe just I would compare this to like graph trans, uh, let's say approach. Uh, or maybe a little bit set as well, where they uh, run several, that they also combine message passing with, uh, with transformers, uh, but in a way where they run the, the message passing layers beforehand as, uh, as kind of first part of the model stack or as some kind of part of the, the encoding information and then apply a stack of transform layers uh, on top. And uh, here we're uh, the, the minute or like but significant difference is that we are combining them in one layer, and we are at each time only applying one layer of MPN and, and avoiding the oversquooting and oversquashing, which in uh, the other approach you might already get to that issue. Uh, so just uh, just a small comparison to to let's say graph trans, uh, where there is that first stack of MPN and layers. Uh, that potentially can over, already oversmooth the signal 
uh, and before it, it, it gets into the, the transformer stack. I saw several other questions. Uh, I haven't managed to read them uh, while I was speaking. Is there no, no, just, uh, just a discussion? Okay, cool. So let's get to uh, to um, uh, the question uh, that that we had a moment ago. Uh, Kobe was uh, who asked it. I yes. think. Um, yeah. So so let's uh, let's talk about it a little bit. So. Right, so with the, with the transformer, uh, the way the attention works is, as we all know, I'm not going to, to repeat it, uh, but uh, uh, we produce the, the linear um, projection uh, on top of the node features to get the query key and value matrices. And then you need to take the, the product of the keys and queries, uh, normalize it, and but most importantly, apply the softmax. Uh, and uh, then with that kind of weighted attention, you aggregate the values uh, from, from all, the, uh, all the other nodes uh, to, to produce the new representation for, for a given node. And uh, this part here, this, this uh, softmax normalized uh, key and query matrix is that attention matrix, right? And that, this is where uh, the other works, other graph transformers inject the structure uh, quite often. So that's where they uh, then rely on actually materializing this, this whole n times n agency matrix, uh, sorry, or attention matrix. Uh, and uh, they need to condition it on, uh, let's say, the random walk distances uh, or uh, something like that. Uh, so graph, graph former is using the short, uh, the shortest uh, path distances, um, then uh, now I'm blanking out some of these other models uh, would, let's say, use a different attention for real edges and uh, and uh, virtual edges. So those, those nodes that are not really connected in the input graph and so on. So you, you really need to then uh, manipulate this N squared matrix. Uh, and the way how, how performer uh, achieve the, the, the linear performance is that they never materialize this, this matrix A, right? So this is just a quick overview of, of, of the, of the uh, kernelized attention uh, where uh, the trick is that they can kernelize the softmax uh, so that it's, um, so that this, this whole matrix A is, is uh, as, as a result of two matrices, some Q prime and K prime instead of the original Q and, uh, Q and K. And then uh, if uh, the whole attention mechanism uh, can then be written as a product of three matrices, uh, then you can change the order in which you multiply them. You don't have to first multiply the, the, these keys and queries that will produce you that uh, n time n. In this case, uh, here it's uh, there in this picture from the original performer paper. They're using the length, right? And it's the length of the sequence. So uh, you, you can avoid materializing uh, that, uh, uh, that L times L uh, matrix by first taking a product of these, uh, these two matrices, the, the K prime and V, and only then multiplying it with, with Q prime. And then uh, you, you never uh, get actually that L squared complexity. So that's kind of the uh, high level idea. So then like really the, the trick is really doing the kernelization the right way and so on. In, in case of performer, it's, uh, it's, it's kernelization through random projections and there might be other ways. Uh, but uh, if your transformer uh, approach, graph transformer approach relies on conditioning the attention matrix, then it's not straightforward how we would use, use this kind of uh, trick to to achieve the linear attention. Uh, of course, there's like a big bird or something like that where you could have, let's say, some kind of uh, locality on a diagonal, but uh, then you're getting into uh, very specific architectures. So I'm not saying that there is no other way, but we kind of elegantly avoided it by using the MPNN to embed the local uh, neighborhood and the real edge features and uh, append also all these uh, 
uh, positional encodings so that the transformer can implicitly take uh, this position into account and all this information is already encoded in the uh, node embedding and does not then require this conditioning, direct conditioning of the attention matrix in the, in the global attention mechanism. So does that answer the, the question? Uh, so here it's a good time to have more discussion on that. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does answer uh, my question. My uh, question was more coming from the approach side. So, as as Dominic also said in the uh, chat that you know, send uh, in current current form also use, uh, for example, uh, or requires ages in the attention. But if if we think uh, more from the conceptual side uh, away from the implementation, these piece can also be directly modified to not use edges, for example, and then use a linear transformer. Uh, with them, or for example, graph it. Uh, there was one paper from Milan et al. So I'm just trying to understand uh, the conceptual difference between your work and a slight modification in, in the existing transformer-based work. Yeah, we have a, an ablation in the paper. Uh, we'll go to that, I think, in a few, in a few mm -hmm. seconds, that if you just uh, put a linear transformer re in, in the graph trans original architecture, then it suddenly will stop working. So it will, it will not work that well at all. So you, you still need some locality bias. So from that perspective, uh, simply replacing uh, square layer with linear layer doesn't work in experiments. No, but, but for example, in the uh, other transformer models like Graphit, for example, right? They, they also have uh, some of the uh, PEs which they don't really require edge features. So have you also tried those things and then then make a stronger case yeah yeah yeah, the, yeah that will go, will, will go in experiment with evolution okay. yes graphic as far as i recall is actually not using any edge features like the implementation in the paper i think literally uh, like says that, that uh if the approach could be extended to to make use of edge features but but the way how they they had it in the paper is is not using any edge features um and also they are still conditioning based on that uh heat kernel right so uh I yeah two step and yeah three step yes yeah yeah, yeah. so so they they okay. need to condition the attention uh cool uh, otherwise yeah like you as one of the baselines that we tried is is what if you just uh take out this this graph attention right uh, sorry, take out the local message passing and, and just use a, a transformer or performer and just rely on the positional and structural encoding to, to provide enough information and uh, ignore edge features and such, or maybe, uh, but uh, it ends up being quite a bit worse. Um, so we'll, we'll get to it. Um, so we are just a few slides away from that. Uh, so let me just show you a couple of results first. So we uh, benchmarked um, this GPS approach on all of the benchmarking GNN data sets from, from VJ's paper from uh, a couple of years back, like two years back, uh, and uh, achieved uh, really good performance, uh, particularly on zinc. Uh, this is some of the like state of the art, but it's, you know, the state of the art claims are always kind of in flux. I think uh, there might be some papers that are claiming a uh, few uh, hundreds or thousands under like uh, like this value around like 0 0.69 or something like that. But uh, that's really kind of within the, the variance. Um, and just the point is it, it, it worked well uh, right on, on this data set uh, as also compared to the other graph transformers. Uh, here, just if you recall, let's say Graphformer or Sand, they are uh, almost twice, they have almost twice the, the error. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get, get, get to a little bit of a discussion with the ablation studies. So that's why I'm just pointing out these values. Um, so this is a solubility prediction uh, on zinc. So it's predicting the log P of the, of the molecule uh, band that. Uh, just a quick quick answer to that. Um, 
All right, and then on Open Graph Benchmark, we uh, uh, also uh, benchmark all the graph level prediction data sets. Uh, we found on these molecular data sets like MolHIV and MolPCDA, the overfitting has been quite the issue. Uh, and, uh, oh, um, that's right, that's right. okay. Uh, and uh, there, uh, oops. Sorry. Yeah, uh, so there we found the overfitting to be quite the issue. And so it seems to be an issue for a lot of transformer based models. They really had to start achieving really good performance only after uh, they retrain a model on something like PCQM4M, which has 3 million something molecules, and then fine tune it to, uh, to these data sets. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it's these these areas. It's kind of, kind of notorious. You know, you have to deal with the overfitting. Um, and all these other data sets that are bigger and more challenging and are not as uh, kind of common, like uh, this MolHIV and MolPCDA is, is very common, uh, not commonly used in, in papers. A lot of people uh, shoot for it. Um, and in these other ones, we also with very little hyperparameter tuning, pretty much reusing hyperparameters from, from other existing models. We got uh, state of the art or close to state of the art uh, values. Um, yeah. Um, and questions. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, a lot of chat questions pop up, but I had I'm at uh, the moment to to read them all. Uh, anything anyone wants to ask directly? Yeah, I have a question. Why did you test uh, the end performance on the uh, three benchmarking tests, uh, which are, uh, I, I think, of empty for the moment? The CIN model. Again? The CIN awesome. model. Yeah, they didn't record results for PCBA or PPA on the one called two. And, uh, I think CNN is kind of the state of the art model for the market property prediction task due to its strong inductive bias of uh, extracting motifs of the graph. I think it may also from your model if you test the end model on this three benchmarking task. It's worth trying. It's good. Uh, but uh, good. which one was it that, uh, you were talking about, Sin? Because I, I have a little bit of troubles uh, uh, hearing you. Uh, so... Uh huh. You're talking about SYN or, or which one? Yes. And, and... I was just saying that it, it's worth trying out SYN model. Yeah. Uh, that one it shows very strong performance. Maybe, maybe answer. Yeah. Let me answer. Uh, it, it's good, but also I think it, it doesn't scale as well as far as I recall. Uh, so it might have. Well, I think those data sets are fairly small data sets. So even if SYN model doesn't scale and there's current configuration, it might still have a very good performance. Good, uh, good performance. It's not exactly true. The, the PPA and code two are relatively big. Uh, for code two, you have uh, you have a um, lot larger graph sizes, like even up to uh, like thousand or, or more. Yeah, and since uh, I'm just I'm just referring to these models. Yeah, SYN would mine uh, cycles like three, four, five up to some mm -hmm. K cycle, and uh, on PPA and code two, since they are much denser graphs, it will explode to like millions. So instead of you would go from a uh, say order one graph to the graph over where you have millions of nodes, that would be pretty scale. Pretty okay, but guys, like the takeaway on the results. Um, wh how do you concur with the statement, or how much do you concur with the statement? For these data sets that are smaller, we maybe don't see so much, uh, maybe using graph transformers does not make so much sense. And maybe for some data sets like PCQM for M, they are using graph transformers becomes really interesting. Yeah, I do agree. Like uh, one aspect is the size of the graph, and one the other is size of the data set. So uh, graph transformers, in my opinion, are definitely a lot more uh, data hungry when it comes to, to training. You really uh, to to like really fit them and avoid overfitting. Uh, you you need, uh, in my opinion, a lot larger data sets. Uh, 
Uh, so a lot of these small benchmarking data sets uh, are not really suitable for that. Um, yeah. And uh, you will, and it, I think it really starts to shine more with uh, this kind of molecular data sets where you can have these couple millions of, of examples. And, and also uh, you have more kind of recurring uh, patterns in, in these millions of examples to learn that global attention in a, in a meaningful way. And what do you think about pre-training with pcqm 4 m and then fine-tuning on these smaller data sets? Yeah, I think that's that's uh, what we've seen to be uh, fairly efficient, uh, like uh, successful on the benchmarks. Like when you look at the OGB uh, leaderboard for mole PCBN and mole HIV, uh, the uh, the high-ranking uh, transform models are first pre-trained. On, on the PCQM 4M and then fine tuned for these tasks. Uh, but it's also not super straightforward from what I saw for, let's say, graph transport, uh, graph former, that I think it's just around like 31 or almost 32 or something like that uh, on a small PCBA. Uh, they also needed to use flag for, uh, for the augmentation of the input while by fine tuning and based on their. Uh, based on the, the, the supplementary information in their paper, uh, they, they require quite a bit of hyperparameter tuning to, to make that happen. Okay. So, so it's, so yeah, it's a way, but it's also not such a super straightforward, like out of the box, uh, like minimal effort right away works uh, type of approach. Yeah. Uh, if that's right. But yeah, yeah sure. um, but then we also have a few raised hands. Uh, Dom, what do you say? Should we let Fabrizio go first or you? Uh, I just, uh, I'm going to be quick. So uh, yeah, I'll go, go first. Uh, so for, yeah, so for the fine tuning, remember also like Graformer had 150 million parameters. Here we are comparing with models with 100,000 or like uh, six for, for HIV and uh, 6 million for PCBA. So it's massively smaller. And this is why like fine tuning uh, needs a lot of compute as well because of the hyperparameter search. Um, and uh, for your earlier comment that uh, graph transformers shine in the larger data sets. Uh, well, what, what we've seen in this work is that a graph transformer can still be very efficient also in, in some small data set um, by using this hybrid approach. So basically like, since we have a hybrid approach, the MPNN probably takes the lead in these small data sets. Uh, and the only data set where we don't have a good score is HIV because HIV is known to be problematic and have and really correlate ba badly between the VAL and the test set. Um, so this is the only data set where uh, the hybrid model did not work. Uh, and the hybrid model showed that it worked very well in general, in small data set and in large data set as well, because the MPNN and the transformer can uh, can take the, the lead, whether like de depending on what kind of uh, data we have. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. Uh, Fabrizio, what's your Hi, everybody, and thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, it was great. Uh, so the like I wanted to bring this up, maybe it's related to what Dominique said. I don't think like saying that OGBG mol HIV is problematic is the right thing to do. It's not just problematic because there's no correlation between validation and test. This is really done on purpose. Like the split is not random. So the molecules have been split according to a certain scheme. So to me, more than a problem, this is actually an interesting thing to study. That is how the, the models general, you generalize out of distribution. And like if you take a look at zinc, so there the standard split is random as far as I know. And you had really good results. But here, like it seems like the non-random split might be affecting the results. So my impression is that the models, um, as many other models, not gonna be wrong, uh, if not all of them, is having problems generalizing out of distribution. So I wanted to bring this in, you know, intuition on the table and ask if you had any um, comments on this. Before we get into that, Fabrizio, do you know if the, or does anyone know uh, if the PCQM4M split is a scaffold split or not? 
a ramp it's a on scaffold. Much be, I think uh, it's a scaffold for all the molecules, but I um, might be wrong. Uh, don't don't quote me on this, but I, as far as I remember, it should be scaffold on all the molecular. Yeah, I think we have someone who knows uh, who just commented. Yeah, yeah uh, so on the for... PCQ for uh, what I recall, it is uh, the scaffolds that they had some issues with contamination in the V1 version, but uh, I think in V2 it should be based on scaffolds. Uh, okay, good. But then, what do you think about uh, Fabrizio's comment regarding? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, want to uh, add that, that PCBA is also a scaffold split. So um, it's not like it's not. I don't think the problem with HIV is the the problem of the split. Uh, I think I think there's many other issues there uh, that that have to be taken into account. And one of the issue is uh, that the fact that there is not a strong correlation between validation and test set also means that people fine tune the hyperparameter on the test set instead of the validation set. Uh, or at least this is what we've observed. Uh, if, if, you take, if you take a plot of the validation scores and the test scores that are on the OGB benchmark, you can see clear the correlation. Like you can see that the model with the best test score have the worst validation score or uh, amongst, amongst the worst. And very, very few model I think SYN is the only one that has good scores in both the validation and the test. The other ones fail, uh, like seem to uh, fine tune the model based on the on the test score to achieve better better results. So, so in some sense, like uh, HIV is is not the best data set to really benchmark methods. Um, if we want to benchmark scaffold splits. Uh, uh, using scaffold split on such a data set like HIV, uh, one should pro uh, the, the data set should probably be changed to a cross validation instead of a single split. But that, that's my uh, that's my opinion there. Yeah. Well, so I think it is a good thing if we have little correlation between the validation and the test sets and or well not necessarily a good thing but not a bad thing and yeah if we if people fine-tune their parameters on the test set that is a problem but that's the only problem that i see and i think that would be the case for every um every data set that we could look at I think we are, we are kind of getting into into like the, the point of like whether you want like a general graph benchmarking or whether uh, you're really more interested in that uh, particular out of uh, distribution generalization uh, and then uh, really start digging deeper into the application area of uh, let's say this kind of um, drug property prediction or such um, and uh, uh, just empirically, we've seen this on these small HIV models that uh, are more parameter efficient and avoid the overfitting tends to perform better. And uh, graph transformer based models are not in that category. So I think that's otherwise, I agree with it, with uh, what uh, Dominic, uh, Dominic said. Uh, all right. Um, so with uh, PCQM4M, uh, we already talked about that one too. So we got good results on that one as well with much fewer parameters than the other transform models. And we also compared like the, the parameter budget of uh, comparable to the message passing models then, then uh, also on that, uh, that budget, we outperformed those. And I think uh, recently EGT, I think we had the, the final paper put out and I think they tuned this 90 million parameter model to be uh, one ten thousand better than, than our value here. I think they, they reached uh, 0 0.857 validation here uh, with the, the 90 million model. Uh, I would say we, we, we ran uh, this, this hyper parameter is very similar to Graphformer. So there uh, we haven't run too many uh, hyperparameter searches, to be honest. And uh, also we ran it on just one GPU 
uh, thanks to the fact that uh, the model is, is it's much faster. We don't need the four GPU setup that a lot of these other models uh, report. So I think that's that's moving up in a good direction as well. Uh, all right. So if, if uh, you still <clears throat> still with me, let me just quickly go uh, through the Appalachian studies before uh, handing off the uh, uh, the word to to uh, BJ. So. Uh, as, as we saw and, and we, we have been discussing here, like this, this impact of this global attention of the and the local message passing. So we've done those ablation studies because we really wanted to see like, I'm not preaching here that the graph transformers are all you need and, and you should uh, uh, forget about all the other models. We really wanted to see like, uh, is it really working well and, and, and when and under what kind of conditions. And for a lot of the benchmarking data sets, the, the, the honest answer is that you don't need the global attention, uh, that the local message passing is, is just fine. So if you remove the, the, the transformer model uh, for, for Zinc, you still get the same performance. So maybe the positional encodings uh, are uh, more responsible for the performance on Zinc than is the global attention. However, for some other data sets like CFAR10, when, when you start increasing the size of the graphs uh, and also uh, the kind of, uh, there is some kind of prior expectation that those data sets require more of these long range dependencies, you start seeing that the transformer models or the models that have that global attention do outperform uh, the just message passing counterparts. And, uh, uh, something that, that we ran also is this Malnet Tiny, which has graphs of up, up to 5,000 nodes. And for transformer it's uh, and performer models, it's not a problem, uh, especially since we, we're still even with the transformer, we, are, we don't have to manipulate the adjacency matrix. So even if we are using N squared attention, it's still empirically a lot faster than the other graph transformers. Um, and uh, overall, the story would be that most of the data sets that you have out there right now just don't have graphs of, of such size where these linear transformer models would really show much of benefit. Uh, currently, a lot of these benchmarking data sets really have graphs sub 5,000 nodes. And on those, you can just uh, run the N squared tension. Um, so, and with the Big Bird, Big Bird has a quite a bit different kind of uh, um, sparse attention mechanism. We try to uh, modify it and adjust it for, for this graph application, uh, but uh, empirically it has not worked for us uh, that well. And then uh, when you remove the message, uh, the, the message passing and just use the, the transformer, uh, you see that we still achieve, uh, sorry, uh, we still achieve 11 point, uh, 11 3 here, 113 on Zinc, which is still better than, uh, than the other transformers uh, had. So again, it probably shows that uh, uh, the, the message that the, the um, positional encoding or structural encoding is very vital. And then even if you uh, put a vanilla transformer on top of it, you get a pretty good performance. Um, so it seems like uh, really the combination of, uh, in this case, it's the, the positional encoding and structural encodings that are, that are really powerful. And then in these other data sets, uh, we then more see that also the, the uh, global attention and choice of message passing uh, start matter more and more. Uh, okay, then uh, we also look at like these different types of positional encodings, how well they work. Uh, I'm running kind of out of time, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but uh, kind of the high level summary was that we saw that the, the random walk structural encodings work very well for, for molecular data. Uh, not all of them, but, for, but uh, many times it was the random walk structural encodings and the uh, Laplace in positional encodings perform better when you really need this global positional information, like in this image derived data sets, uh, like CPAR 10 and, and so on. Uh, Signet, uh, on the other hand, is uh, probably the most universal one uh, with the deep sets. I think it uh, overall 
uh, perform like uh, it's the, the single best performing embedding probably, and it's probably because it, uh, as I mentioned, combines aspects of the positional uh, encoding thanks to the the, the, the Laplacian eigen vectors that it's initialized with, and uh, the fact that they also apply gene and probably can capture some uh, local structure into the positional encoding as well. And uh, then uh, the peg layer didn't work too well for us. It's probably because it's only applied in uh, the local message passing layer and uh, uh, doesn't explicitly append any uh, any encoding to, to the node features. So it's much harder to make use of it than in the uh, in the global attention. So that might be one of the reasons as well. Um, so okay, so why that's why do you think a sign that works the best? Uh, well, because it's uh, kind of generalizing the, the Laplacian PEs, uh, but also has the aspect of the random walk, uh, or, or sorry, uh, aspect of the structural uh, encoding as well, because it's running the gene layer, and uh, the, the gene layer is uh, run using the original structure of the graph. So uh, on top of having the information from the uh, Laplacian decomposition, uh, it also has, yeah, but is in a way uh, using also the local structure of the neighborhood because it's it's using. But here in these experiments, are you also using the MPNN layers? Uh, yeah. So this is. A so yeah. So this is probably. The reason that SignNet is doing the best is then probably not the fact that we additionally have the uh, graph structure encoded in the position encoding in uh, in this message passing sort of way, but that we have the graph structure encoded um, via the Laplacian position encoding and in a more principled way than the Laplacian position encoding because we get rid of the sign flip issue right yeah could it could be that as well could be definitely uh that that aspect to it as well i think uh yeah that's a better point i i sh should should say that too of course the fact that we are not relying just on the sign flipping is definitely could be an aspect and uh it's something that um uh yeah maybe we can't quite uh um tell which aspect is more important but uh yeah, so it, it, it can can be that too. Uh, on the other end, like just to like mention, like it's on the expense of the of the runtime because you you will need to run the the eight layer gene um, as as part of the the pipeline for 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 each forward pass and backward pass. Uh, it makes the model uh, like a lot slower. So uh, the sign definitely has a bit of a no penalty on on the runtime um all right uh was there a, a question uh to yeah. answer at this point i just wanted to add uh, also like uh sign, i believe that signet can replicate or uh at least approximate heat kernels um by summing the different eigenvectors um, and using the the eigenvalues as well um, and the heat kernels are related to the random mock structural encoding. So uh, as Ladislav had said, uh, using sign that can retrieve some sort of structural encoding uh, to, due to, to that aspect. All right, uh, so let me just then quickly summarize this section. And that is that I hope that I convinced you with the experimental results and also the modularity of the approach that this is a, a quite general blueprint for building a graph transformer enabled model uh, because you can really uh, mix and match the, the type of positional and structural encodings and uh, the way I will do the local and global propagation. It's probably powerful uh, because with these many of these positional encodings, you automatically improve the 1WL expressivity of the message passing neural network 
because the message passing neural networks are one WL limited only in case of anonymous uh, nodes. But once you add uh, um, information like uh, derived, let's say, from the Laplacian and such, uh, you go beyond one WL. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, additionally, then uh, uh, the, the claim about uh, it being general approximator uh, of uh, functions on graphs uh, that Stan made also applies uh, to this model. So under the, the assumption that, that your capacity would, would go up exponentially, that you could like kind of increase the, the representation size in each layer uh, exponentially, then, uh, then that that kind of argument would hold here as well. So it is uh, powerful and it's scalable uh, thanks to that uh, decoupling of that uh, local uh, processing and of the, the global processing and not having to condition that agency matrix. And uh, if you do use performer, then it is uh, linear in the number of edges. Of course, that is subject to uh, having the uh, the pre-computation done, so such as the uh, if you're using eigenvector uh, Laplace in eigenvectors, then you need to uh, do that first, and uh, that's uh, the pre-processing step. However, in in practice, unless you you start getting to graphs of size well above several tens thousands, it's it's not such a such a bottleneck. I think even on the largest data sets. The pre-processing wouldn't take more than an hour and a half in, in our ex, uh, experiments, and that would be data sets that that have uh, many, many, many nodes. Uh, sorry, many, many graphs and uh, with, with many nodes. So, in practice, not such a such a big big bottleneck. Very well, uh, and uh, uh, so. Please go ahead. Uh, another round of uh, questions. Uh, otherwise, then. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the new data sets that we, we've uh, made for, uh, for challenging the, the benchmarking a little bit more. Uh, yeah. Do we have a question there? You... Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, maybe the, the last one about, the, oh, sorry. It was, you I go. see the one in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by, by Richard, that's about, uh, uh, swapping attention indeed. Like I want to maybe put the link that, to this recently released paper, maybe a few days ago, uh, by Google guys. So they explore different variations of uh, attention compared to vanilla attention, like all those performers, Big Birds, and uh, uh, like MLP mixer and other stuff. And they find that uh, vanilla transformer scales better. <laughs> Whatever you try, just uh, uh, just scale the bigger. Transformer. Well, the, the question here, uh, we do not know yet uh, whether there exists such scaling loss for transformers on graphs. Like you see that performer is a very big model, like 150 M parameters, and uh, uh, there are lesser, well, smaller models with lesser amount of parameters, and they, they work better. So it, it might be still a question that we do not train it uh, until, until the slow convergence, so still not enough time, or some. Uh, uh, maybe different inductive biases, but we still do not have uh, an evidence that simply scaling up uh, transformers would work for molecules. There, there was some evidence recently for protein tests, like the recent uh, ESM models from, from Bayer. Uh, uh, but for molecular tasks, yeah, maybe it's also connected to Hannes' uh, point that uh, uh, the data sets are way too small, like we need dramatically larger data sets for those graphs. For those are big models. I mean, we don't we don't need data sets for models, right? We need models for data sets, but we're seeing that these models are maybe not so good for the small data sets, better for the big data sets, but this is maybe not so true. If we first pre-train them with big data sets and then uh, evaluate them on the small, yeah, and then use them for the small data sets. Well, pre-training is also limited to, for instance, the, your tokenization, right? So if you pre-train on PCQM, you can use it on PCBA, yes, uh, or, or generally on anything that has the same atoms and bond types. You cannot use pre-trained performer on code two. That would be literally impossible. 
So uh, in language, no. we can uh, generate uh, on text, uh, but uh, on, if you pre-train on molecules, you cannot use the pre-trained molecular transformer on other text. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not literally impossible, right? You can still just, you just haven't seen that token during training, during pre-training then, right? Yeah, there was actually a, a recently released collection of papers by Berkeley guys about universal compute engines, like transformers with frozen layers. You just swap the embedding layer and uh, have the pre-trained frozen uh, transformer and see what happens. Yeah. Some people claim it works, some, uh, then uh, some other guys say it doesn't. But uh, yeah, for, for grass, we have definitely smaller vocabulary of possible stuff when well, we talk about multiple. Yeah. But it's still just amazing that these sort of things work, or at least a little bit. Yes. Um, so there was a fair paper app released a few weeks after, and they say that no, it actually doesn't work. They uh, <laughs> screwed up the network parameters. So it's still a debatable question. Interesting. Yeah. Then what is what are your thoughts? Do you know about the new paper that like tokenizes the edges as well? We'll have that soon in the reading group as well. Oh, yeah, I think that's uh, uh, that's very similar to the EGT. Uh, EGT also is using uh, edges as tokens. Uh, so then uh, the sequence is not just token of nodes, but tokens derived from nodes and edges. Uh, so it's not a brand new idea, I would say, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm uh, curious to see the presentation. I feel like it's, uh definitely a lot more computationally uh expensive right like now you you, you will have n plus e tokens uh and uh you really then rely on having a good positional encodings or something that really ties uh how the edges are actually connected to the nodes and uh uh Interesting idea, but I'm not sure whether like removing that that uh, amount of structure and having to relearn it from the data is the most efficient way to go. Okay. Yeah. Then I think I think for this paper, like where they do the node node edges uh, both as tokens, there was one question asked by uh, I think Kuldeep earlier, like if we simply use the scalable transformers in place of the SAN or Graforma, which they use n square transformers, will it work or not? I think uh, the the transformer that does both nodes and edges as tokens, it's a great way to uh, experiment that idea there because then we don't have the problem of using edge features uh, like we uh, do in SAN or or like the M message passing neural network module does in the GPS. I mean, if, if you're able to relate to the question that uh, uh, was asked earlier, like why do we need uh, the MPNN here? And uh, what we, why would we would simply uh, cannot uh, improve this existing n square transformer by using a scalable linear transformer? So, so this is uh, one uh, area that I think it, it's a uh, good uh, to try on where they're both nodes and edges as tokens. Okay, thank you. So um, let's move on to the yeah. last part of the slides uh, so that we, we have time to finish everything. Um, who's the speaker? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, hey. yeah, let, let me take over from there. Thanks, Ladislav, uh, for the presentation so far and uh, everyone for the discussions. So uh, we had some questions regarding data sets and how the data sets that we had so far may not be uh, appropriate uh, to I mean, for the models that we are trying to propose here earlier. So we saw there were some uh, very close numbers between uh, existing bench, existing models and the GPS results. So to precisely add, uh, make an, a first step in that direction, we have this another uh, work where we propose long range graph benchmarks. So we focus on on the actual need of transformer, the, the technical, the theoretical, the intuitive need, why we need to have uh, global attention in transformers or why we need to have such architectures. So motivated by this, we uh, focus on having uh, or proposing graph benchmarks that are will be 
uh, requires long range reasoning to perform well on these tasks. So we have three different domains of data sets in this benchmark. So uh, the, the aspects that we, we tackle to propose these benchmarks is like the graph sizes. I mean, if they're, the graph sizes are small, naturally a message passing neural network with very strong position and structure encodings would perform better. And also it's seen in the results. And uh, the, so the first is the graph size. Second is the nature of task. What is the nature of the task? Does it require uh, uh, propagation of information between long uh, hop neighbors or not? And the third is the contribution of the global information. So aspects uh, such as these. Uh, so I think uh, there's no, uh, not much time to go in detail, but I will just uh, uh, say that like these are the aspects that we, we, we consider when uh, proposing these benchmarks. And the first uh, domain is the super pixel graphs, which uh, where we convert the existing uh, image benchmarks such as the Pascal VOC and MS Coco uh, to node classification benchmarks. So how it works is each image is converted into uh, uh, a graph of super pixels. So uh, you, as you can see in this fig figure, and then uh, a region boundary graph is uh, created out of that. So uh, the final region boundary graph is on like on the right where each node has uh, adjacent neighbors if it has the regions adjacent in the original image. So we, when we create this graph, uh, this illustration shown is with the reduced super pixels, but actually the uh, number of super pixels nodes are uh, around the range of 500. So the super pixel graph becomes uh, co considerably large and also its average diameter also increases compared to existing super pixel benchmark that it makes a good candidate for a long range uh, graph benchmark. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that in some of the results uh, in the following slides. Next we have is uh, the peptide data sets. So this is, uh, uh, there are two, two tasks uh, from in this uh, peptides data set benchmark. The first is uh, to predict functional uh, class of peptide and second is uh, predicting structures. So in this we have, we fulfill two conditions. First, the condition of uh, the graph size. So because uh, uh, of the, uh, we, we use the molecular graph of, from the peptides, the graphs are a bit large than the existing molecular uh, benchmarks. And second is the, the class uh, such as, uh, uh, I mean, the, the label prediction such as in the case of uh, peptide structural data set, which is uh, to predict the different uh, uh, properties such as inertia, uh, uh, length and so on, uh, which are derived from the 3D structures, uh, uh, 3D information of the peptide uh, data set. So, uh, so we have a couple of benchmarks from this peptide uh, uh, domain as well. And the third is uh, 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 the third is a link prediction data set that uh, we derive from the uh, PCQ M4M uh, uh, sources. So we convert this into a link prediction task where uh, if two atoms are in 3D contact uh, under a threshold of a certain distance, but they're far in 2D, so we select five hops for that. So if there are such contacts to be predicted, it, it becomes a long range uh, uh, propagation task uh, by, by design. And, uh, and so, so this is the third task uh, we, we, we do uh, for the long run benchmark. So in total, we have five different data sets where two tasks are super pixels, where, uh, yeah, the first two are super pixels, where uh, it is a node classification uh, problem. The, the second is the PCQM contact, which is link prediction. And the third is peptides, which is graph label uh, tasks. And if you see in the third column here, the average diameter, and you try to compare with the existing benchmarks, these are uh, at least five to six times larger than the existing benchmark, benchmarks, such, such as if we see uh, compared to uh, Pascal and Coco with the existing Amnesty and CIFAR, the average diameter is around six to eight. In the case of peptides, functional and structural data sets, the average diameter of uh, existing similar data sets such as enzymes and, and proteins, they are around, uh, I remember like nine to 10. So, so the average diameter, it, it's considerably increasing. And uh, referring to the paper like on the information bottleneck, uh, the 2021, I think, Isela paper. So uh, in that you could, I mean, they, they, there's a very nice study, like if, if these, uh, the, the radius of problem uh, increases as even even like by few uh, numbers like from maybe four to five or five to six and so on the problem of the information bottleneck is is very huge so so one of the factors of these uh, uh, 
data sets becoming uh, ideal to test long run long range uh, capacities is because we have uh, these statistics which make it uh, suitable for uh, testing the long range uh, dependencies uh, and and the diameter uh, and also the nature of tasks that we uh, these data sets possess so uh, to round up one with the experiments we try to see like how existing uh, like local message passing gnns and transform based gnns perform and and it's it uh, we we observe that, that we we have a very uh, uh, almost clear sense of uh, uh, observation that uh, when we have architectures with uh, uh, long range uh, reasoning capabilities such as the fully connected transformers and also our, the gps that uh, Lajislav uh, was presenting earlier. When we have these kind of models, the performance are uh, very uh, considerably uh, different than the existing models, which do not have long range dependencies. And the two results on the super pixels uh, show exactly the same uh, inference. Uh, also, the experiments on on the rest of the three uh, examples, like the peptides, uh, two, two peptide datasets, and PCQM contact, we observe a more or less similar. Uh, 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 observation that uh, the, the transformers, uh, the existing transformers, such as the vanilla graph transformer with the positional encoding and the SAN uh, are better than the message passing genus without any long range capabilities. And then when we bring in our graph uh, uh, GPS uh, model, uh, we improve the existing performance uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the transformer. So, so now like uh, to sum up this uh, long range graph benchmark, this is, I think we, it's, it's still a first step, but uh, what we found is like uh, also answering to some of the questions in the, in the earlier half that uh, maybe we did not, the, 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 yeah, the, the models that uh, we were comparing in the previous uh, benchmarking GNNs and OGB data sets, the graph data sets, uh, maybe we are not able to test this specific capability of whether a model is able to capture or reason in long range uh, in a graph or not. So now we have uh, specific benchmarks where we can test these abilities and our baselines empirically shows that when we have uh, such capabilities in a model, specifically graph transformer with some sort of global tension mechanism, we do uh, have an absorbed uh, increase of performance. So, so yeah, that's in short about the long range graph benchmark. Uh, you are uh, welcome to uh, visit the paper, read some more details in, in how we, we prepare different tasks and, and the properties of different data sets. And also it's, it's open sourced. Uh, so you can, when you, when you are going to evaluate your next graph transfer model, do uh, check out uh, and, and perform experiments on these five long range graph benchmark data sets. So, so that's it from the long range graph benchmark. Uh, perhaps I would I would uh, pass to Ladislav to uh, conclude with the summary. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you so much, Vijay. Uh, and I would just uh, mention that uh, with the LRGB that was also joined the work with uh, Ali Parvi. So uh, Ali's in the call as well. So wanted to to make sure that we uh, we acknowledge him as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think uh, we're we're quite uh, out out of time. So uh, I, I think. Thank you all for, for the discussion. And uh, I would just like really summarize that I hope that I showed you the, the different components uh, that make the model, uh, the GPS, uh, the, the uh, uh, generalizable, powerful, and scalable. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it really ends up working pretty well for us in, in a lot of the, the, the data sets that we tried uh, with uh, much fewer parameters in many cases than other graph transformers. And uh, it's and whether it, this is the end of the road, uh, definitely not. Uh, I think it's just a very interesting point that you can combine this local and global attention in a meaningful way, and uh, it also showcases how powerful the, the positional and structural encodings are. And uh, uh, for that, we also have these new data sets really that uh, can uh, uh, test the models' uh, scale scalability and uh, whether they really can effectively represent uh, long range interactions in, in these uh, data sets because these graphs are definitely much larger than uh, what is typically being used. And uh, with that, yeah, thank you all for, for the, the great questions. Um, and I've been uh, really happy to be here and for all my authors, uh, co-authors as well. Uh, 
thank you all for 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 being here and uh, working on this project. So thank you, Hannes, for having us.